hypothesis.is. It's the word hypothesis with the is as the extension. Uh, let me sign out. So here I went to hypothesis.is, and I need to get started. So first thing I do is click on free account, add in my username, add in my email address, come up with a password, and hit sign up. Now I can then log in. after you'd get a confirmation email. Now, I spoke to the developers at Hypothesis today and their education director. Remember I told you I'd send them an email? I emailed them this morning at eight and they emailed me back already and said, if you just give me a list of all the New Haven Public School teacher addresses, they will confirm your accounts for you so you don't have to worry about getting the confirmation email. Come September, when you get your student lists, if you have your students create a, um, create an account, and we just make a spreadsheet for all your students per class. They will also go in and auto-confirm all of those accounts for you. So then you don't have to worry about, you can get your students on the system. So how does it work? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is I want to install the extension. Uh, hold on. So I want to drag and drop the extension in. So I'm going to go down. And see where it says install our add-on for Chrome? I'm going to click add extension. Now, Rob, I know you're a Firefox user. If you Thank you. If you click on other browsers, they have a bookmark link. You can drag into Firefox and use that. Um, but your kids are all on Chromebooks, so I'm showing you how to install the Chrome extension. Now, you'll notice that I have a little speech bubble up there in the right that that's how I can turn it on and off. So if we were to go to any news article today, and why did, here's the Washington Post, I can hit my annotation tool, and then hit highlight, annotate. And here I'm on my public page, and I can write, I wonder why, if it was about nothing, why the meeting wasn't reported. Of course, my phone starts ringing and I'm during a live demo. Um, that why the meeting wasn't reported. And I can post to my public. Now, with public annotations, you need to know that they're all released in the public domain. That means you don't own the copyright to your own um, annotation. You're, you're giving it out there in the public domain. That doesn't work for students because, A, why should I, and then my computer starts ringing with the same phone number, um, why should I dictate the license that my kids assign to their work? I think that's something we as teachers need to fight for, that we own our curriculum um, versus saying our district's owning it. Uh, or that anything that, instead of it being work for hire for the district, that everything that you guys make as teachers is automatically assigned a Creative Commons license versus New Haven Public Schools All Right Reserve license. But that's a much bigger fight that's way above my pay grade. Um, but they have this really cool feature called private groups. So you can set up a private group for each one of your classes. So if you make a private group, See, these are all my, I make a different group for every one of my classes. I can do, go down here, click on new group. I can name this um, New Haven Public Schools GIS Institute. We already have a private group, but I'm just showing you how to do that. Added a little description. And then I create the new group. I then have this link that I can send out to my students or put in my Google Classroom. So if you're already, for those, most of you have started building your Google Classroom or next fall, just add this, um, 
add a link to the for each one of your created group for each one of your classes, and then add that link to your Google Classroom. And that's one of the first things you have your kids do is you sign up for that group. So if you're on that annotations, you can then go through. But what do we do? How do we do this? Well, if you go to hold on, let's work. When I run my annual um, question the web MOOC for, for teachers and students around the world, we do a lot with annotations. Hold on, let me find it. Well, it might take too long to load. So we went through screencasting, hacking credibility, annotating the web, and there's a bunch of student activities that you can do that focus on sourcing. But with annotations, for example, I have the tutorial that you can just copy and paste and use it for your students when you want to te teach them how to do it. And I also have, I'm trying to look for something. I can find it. Identify credibility markers in websites. So what, what I did with my students is I gave them a series of websites and they had to look for different credibility markers in these fake websites. This is before fake news was even a thing. I was kind of thinking about this for quite some time. Um, but what you do is you can have them look for credibility websites. But what about argumentative writing? If you were to annotate a document for an argumentative writing, what kind of codes would you use? What would you guys annotate? If you're writing up, I give you a piece of a source in history. We're trying to prove did Truman need to drop to stick with a, you know, the, the go-to argumentative piece? Did Truman need to drop the atomic bombs on Japan? And I gave you some sources around that, that inquiry question. What, how would we annotate those sources? What do you guys think? What are some ideas? What would you, what kind of codes or what kind of things would you do in your annotations? What? Evidence. All right, that could be, we could do evidence. Hold on, I'm looking for, um, ah, my battery's gonna run out. Carl, can you go, is Carl in here? No, all right. Code book. <laughs> Oh, wrong one. Too many Google accounts. <coughs> yeah, so here, this is when I last ran the um, Question the web website. These are the these are the codes that we came up with. All, tagging for author, tagging for claims, tagging for reason, tagging counterclaims, tagging for evidence, using having a class name tag, um, and organization. And then we talked about what would be a possible example. What's the goal of the annotation? So what you want to do with your kids is just like any kind of annotation. Develop a code book for annotating for arguments in social studies. What are the unique disciplinary skills that students need in order to annotate with a purpose? Remember, annotating without purpose is simply highlighting. And we know when we teach kids to highlight, what happens is we just get a big, fat, yellow book. <laughs> they just took a regular, clean book and turned it and make it a yellow book. You need to annotate with purpose. So we developed this code book, and then when we're in hypothesis you know let me so we're, we have our did Truman need to drop the bomb we have our inquiry question kind of and so here's no other choice what do you think the position of this piece is uh, yeah, no choice, but yeah, yeah so I could then Highlight this, turn on, oh, it's already, look, some, some people have already even annotated this piece. It's got three annotations of, of an article.
There are three arguments usually marshaled against the use of the bomb. So these would be counterclaims, right? So then I can look how, look at, watch the bottom of this website. This is how much ad tech is going on. I can't even, you, I mean, there's just so much going on in the background for this website. So I'm having trouble annotating this website, which is going too slow. That will happen. Or there we go. We just so then I can annotate. And here I see the tags. Mm -hmm. This is where I can put it in our code book, counterclaims. And then I could then add my response here. The beautiful part about that is when the kids are done, you can then click on all of the counterclaims and be able to see every single one that, that your students have identified. You're no longer teaching about a text, you're teaching in a text. And that's a, when we talk, there's no better way to get close reading, in a sense, because you're looking at how well the kids read. And if you wanted a growth measure of students reading um, argumentative writing in social studies, look at their annotations of September, then have them do it again in May. Count the number of idea units, count the number of, of tags that they use. And you have a perfect assessment that you can administer with fidelity, but actually like get real data that teaches you what your kids actually know and did. And it shows you do it three, four times a year, and you have growth over time. But more importantly, you're assessing them using the tools that historians use. So you're getting that when we talked about those that, you know, when we looked at the C3 frameworks, now we're really talking about the discourses and tools of your discipline. Because you're assessing them, not with just a multiple choice test, but using the tools that they have. You can also stick in images and videos. Um, so it uses a language called Markdown. But all you need to do is basically insert a picture link there. And that box, that's for accessibility. It's very important to teach your kids that they need to be building an accessible web. So if you have students with visual impairments, that's so that they can still look at a picture description. And so that's just a good, you know, we talk about our kids about diversity. We have to teach them about building a diverse web. So you can just insert a picture there. You can drag and drop YouTube videos in there. Some of the things that I've done with my students when I'm not annotating for our invitation is just use it for discussions. Hey, I want you to read this, this post, but you can only reply to each other using animated GIFs or you can only reply to each other using memes. When you give them the, the meme assignment, students love doing that. And it, it's, it shows such a cool, higher order thinking skill when it comes to reading comprehension, because they have to find an internet meme or make an internet meme that reflects their understanding of the text. So it's a complexity in comprehension that really reflects what it means to be a reader and writer today versus how we read and write history in the past. Plus, they just really like coming up with, you know, I mean, you know, they might get the smartest guy man in the world. I mean, I'd always read in social studies, but when I do, it's with hypothesis or something like, you know, they might, they'll, uh, they'll play that way. So those are the tools. You get block quotes. You can have in your links. Um, if you want to do, you also get this, you also have an equation writing tool uh, so that you can, for the math folks. But, and that's it. And then you can assign it to groups. And when you look at the dashboard, so if I go to my dashboard, okay, or if I, so let me just pick out a group. These all have student data, so I can't show them to you. Um, but then I can select that group to annotate to. And if I just go to my hypothesis, this is what you get. It's kind of like a teacher dashboard for your students. Um, you know, each one of your students will have this user interface. So you'll be able to see, like I've done 522 annotations. You'll be able to see the articles that they've read. Uh, you'll have all of the tags that they've used over here. So if you want to look at all of your code books, you can look at those code books and be able to um, just quickly get a, a snapshot of what all of your, what the opinions of all of your students. And it's, you all have Chromebooks, so it's a powerful tool that works pretty much everywhere. So yeah, I have 759 annotations, I have my whole profile, and you'll be able to do that for any one of your groups. I would show you my groups, but since I'm recording the video and this is gonna go online, I don't wanna display student data. Um, but I can show you how the, the teacher dashboard works in a little bit. But questions on how hypothesis works?
If you register for the account, remember step one, register for the account, and then step two, fill out that spreadsheet, um, I will get your accounts confirmed for you since you guys cannot receive emails from outside of your domain. All right, any questions on that? All right, everybody, thanks. And the next mini workshop will be at one o'clock and I am covering how to find images that you can, that are openly licensed for re remix and reuse. So we teach our kids how to res not just respect copyright, but um, defend the commons. It's basically help, help re using Creative Commons images in the classroom. Thanks, all. Cool.